Welcome to another session of We Connect, where we explore the ideas, companies, and key players that continue to raise the bar in e-discovery. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another installment by uh, Ian and I. I'll, I'll minimize our screen here so you can um, we can we can truly say hi, Ian. Ian, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you very much, Gavin. Thank you. I'm super excited. Uh, we're gonna let everybody kind of jump in here on this webinar. Uh, we did a webinar uh, a few weeks ago on search and we got so many questions during the webinar and afterwards. And we've actually modified this presentation a little bit yep. to cover some more of those things out there. But my name is Gavin Maines. I'm the CEO um, of Avancic, an e-discovery and digital forensics company uh, based basically nowhere now. We, we use the internet. And uh, today we're gonna talk about search. Ian, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, yeah. Ian Campbell, CEO of iConnect. Uh, pleasure to be here today. We make uh, technology to help people solve business problems in and around multi-party access to confidential data. I've uh, been doing this a number of years now. And uh, the one thing we've found over time is that finding the data can be challenging. Um, as some people are very intimidated with anything beyond type in one word, stand back and and see what happens. And I think what we're going to do today, to your point, Gavin, we, we gave some basics of search uh, a few weeks ago, and today we're going to show real world application of that search and in some cases, some, some real cases. And I think that's going to be exciting for the audience to see. Yes, and uh, we are, there's already some questions rolling in, and we definitely want you to ask questions through the chat, through the Q&A. Q&A is the best way because we can check it off and go about it, but we are recording today's session. It will be posted on our website so you can watch it all later or use it against me if you want to in my next deposition. You know, we're open to all those things out there, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We're going to do some slides here, and uh, Ian and I are going to kick it back and forth based on uh, who's got what demo we're going to be doing. So we are going to show some real demos because that's a important you know we all believe in that area so today's you know webinar that you know there's your title up there you know search is not you know it's not obsolete it's not gone away and um, there's our pretty picture so you can see us later but our agenda today are these five things we're going to cover these five things kind of in depth spend a little bit more time on one than the other necessarily and i'll go ahead and stop my video good idea ian and you know here we are the limitations of search i'm going to talk a lot about that Ian and i are going to kind of go back and forth on what limitations mean that's a good thing i promise we're going to talk a little bit more about search term reports and how we use them um, then we're going to talk about PII and some of the really neat tools that are built into um, e-discovery applications to help identify that and uh, data visualization and example documents. Now, now that I've kind of told you this agenda, if something is interesting to you or if you have questions, you know, come up with them now because when we talk about these things, we're going to talk about them in the world in the view of a real world problem. Here's how we solve this problem, and here's how we use technology to solve this problem in this particular you know, type of litigation. But before we get there, I just want to review with everybody that search is not keywords, which is kind of that title, that catchy title. It's not obsolete because keywords are not obsolete and search is not obsolete really in any way. Um, there's a lot of other type of searching we do up there. I mean, one of my favorite searches to do when preparing a production for someone is reminding them, oh, we can go and search for all the documents that are redacted and that necessarily they're redacted and someone hasn't clicked complete or something like that. So there's a lot of different searching up there. You know, Ian, if you were to pick and choose a few of these searches up there, and I'll go again after you, you know, what are, what are some of your, your searches that people don't think are really searches or they forget about? You know, and I, I think um, I, we talked about this last time, Gavin, in and around. Some people like to say, let's start with nothing and build up. And some people like to say, let's start with everything and pare down. And I think, um, and both of those are valid, uh, valid problem solving techniques in order to get to that subset of data, which is specifically important. I think all of these are pretty cool. Um, we're going to talk about a fair number of them today. I love charting and graphing. I'm a, I'm a graphics guy, a visual guy. And I'm, we are going to talk today about some different ways to do that. I think people underestimate concept searching um, because it's very much like Spotify. You know, you're listening to Michael Buble and you say, play more like this, and you don't really expect to get Metallica, you expect to get Frank Sinatra. 
And, 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 that, and it should, that's exactly the way it should work. And, and But when you take that into an e-discovery application, the ability that I'm on this document, show me more like this, um, it literally can be one click. And that can be a very, very powerful way, a very, very powerful tool to pull all that information together. And, uh, the, and, and last but not least, the ability to combine all these together. I wanna look for a name, look for a concept within a certain date range that doesn't contain a certain phrase. Um, again, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Yeah, I think my favorite search up here really is also in integrating graphics and charts and graphs. Uh, today for a client, um, a client is looking for communication between two parties where there's nobody else on the message. You know, I want Ian sending a message to Gavin and I want Gavin sending a message to Ian, but I don't want anybody else in it. And that's one that's a rather complicated search to do, depending on how your processing was done. But when you can put up a chart and say, OK, give me all the things where Ian's in the from or in the to and Gavin is in the from or the to that, you know, not, I'm, I'm not speaking in pure search language. You come up with a search. It's also going to have where Jay or Beth or Lance or Shanda are in that because we CC them or they were on the two or they were also on a BCC in some way. And with a chart, you can go in and say, click, 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 get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of that. And you can narrow down to just the communication between Ian and I. But it also really helps you when you're doing that filtering, realizing, oh, I didn't realize that Gavin and Ian had a conversation with Jeb. That's new. That's different. I didn't realize that. And so this the idea of this visual search and seeing the results beyond just a table view is something that I really think that we we take for granted in the e-discovery world. But jumping right off the cliff here, the limitations of search. Um, and, and I wish I wish I, I should turn my camera back on so you could see my face when I talk about the limitations of search. But the main issue here is that some systems don't have a full search language. Some systems don't have um, indexes that you could control the indexing settings. And the list on the right, the icon there on the right is all the noise words. And we talked about that a little bit at length in the previous webinar. But for instance, you can't in DT search, which is the most common search indexer out there, the default settings are you can't search for the word further. You can't search for the word still. It just counts as a space. So if you're looking for, I want to further my career, you're actually going to be searching for, out of all those words, I want to further my career. Ian, if you were to guess, what is the actual search that DT Search would run? Uh, my guess is the word career. Entirely the word career. Even if you put that sucker in quotes, Every one of those words except for career is in the default noise word list, so you're not going to get that out. And so some systems have these limitations to what their search can do, and they're not as robust as some other things, or you may not be able to control them. You know, my primary example, and I'm going to show the example today, not in Office 365 or not in Gmail, but these email systems that are out there, they don't support things like uh, proximity or near or within searching. It's just not a common thing. And that's the example that I'm going to show you. How do we take our very well-crafted searches that we always get? I'm sure, Ian, and every one of your cases, everybody's search terms run perfect the first time, right? <laughs> well, you know, I, while you're teeing that up, Gavin, I mean, I, I think probably the most common one that we see is people saying, I'm going to review email in Outlook, as in they go and take their Outlook, they go and take someone else's mailbox, they load it into their mailbox. And because people spend a fair bit of time in Outlook, they're comfortable in Outlook, um, but but they don't, you know, they know what they know. Um, but there's a, so much more that you could do if you took that same PST and moved it out of Outlook into an e-discovery review platform. And I think that's really what you're going to try to show today. Yeah, and the limitations, uh, the other limitation that's up there, uh, and I'll cover it in a second, a little bit more, is the is is items without text like scans or pictures. Um, now, pictures often you're not really going to be looking for data in pictures, because pictures are of people and things. But when you're doing an IP theft investigation, or you're searching for someone taking pictures of formulas or, you know, or sheets of some type, that it's pretty common when people are trying to steal something, they take a picture of their computer screen on their personal phone, and then email to themselves or text themselves or something like that. So th this in the Office 365 world, there's a little button that always confuses people for the first time when you're doing e-discovery when the Office 365 engine that says, do you want the non-searchables or the unsearchables? And that's referring to all of the documents that don't have text 
that we can extract in a native way. And, and so when you think about a PDF, there's a PDF which is raster and there's a PDF that's vector based. And a vector based PDF is you have a Word document and you convert it to a PDF by saying save as PDF or print to PDF. All that were all the words in that Word document are going to be searchable in that PDF in most cases. However, if you took that and scanned it, you printed it and then scanned it back in as a PDF, that's going to be a non searchable item that is text. And now, luckily, paper is dead. You know, we don't, we're not doing any paper anymore. We don't print anymore. All those things are gone. So it's not a big deal. Well, that's obviously wrong, but items with the non searchable. So let's go right into the example and then we'll come back to the slide and talk about a few more things. So I'm going to jump out of here and I'm going to show you my terms. So these are the terms that I'm trying to actually run. And, you know, my, my, my lawyer, everybody's agreed on it. You know, we got this accounting near loop. We've got failed near two deals or projects. And so what we're going to do is we're going to convert these search terms so that they could run in Office 365 or in Gmail. And so right off the bat, I can tell you, looking at this, the hat character is not supported. That's a stemming. The uh, stars are supported in certain areas. The parentheses with the ors are not supported, and obviously near. So let's tackle one of the easiest ones, and it's one at the bottom. And so when I search in, you know, say iConnect or an eDiscovery platform for account star near to scandal star, I'm looking for accounting scandals, something like that, or accountant caused scandal because that caused is you know a noise word it goes away and so i'm looking for several different things but i can't search for near two so what i unfortunately have to do is change that to an and so i'm looking for account and scandal that's going to get a lot more things besides the near two but now once i've got my account and scandal i can then load it into a tool which supports proximity searching and narrow it down even further by adding in that near or that within two so that's a really simple example of how we take out some of that proximity and just put it in an and i want documents that have them both well as i, I go think, yeah, go I, I, sorry the, the other thing i was going to say gavin is that you know some of the folks on the phone may have heard the term false positive and and i i know you know when i first got in the industry and certainly when AI became so prevalent, um, I, I heard that term false positive. And if you think about that, that's what you've just shown there, account and scandal is going to give you a lot of positive hits. They're going to be very positive because they're, they do contain those words. Um, however, they're false because what you were really looking for was the near two, which now you can't do. So I think the challenge with that is that although you get all the hits, you get too many hits. And now um, a whole bunch of them are, just that term we talked about, false positives. And I think that's one of the unique things that we're trying to deliver today is there's lots of ways to search for lots of stuff, but you don't want to go and search a million records and get 800,000 returned files. Um, you know, you, you, you want to call it down quickly. And, and I think, um, you know, eliminating or lowering the number of false positives you get is, is one of the techniques that we're going to try, try to incorporate in what we're showing, and it, which is exactly what you're talking about with, with being able to use um, something like a proximity search of near two, as opposed to those overbroad account and scandal searches. Yeah, exactly. And I'll do one more example, then we can move on. And, and I'm going to pick one of the harder ones here. So if we talk about failed near two, and we look at inflate, you know, we actually have to change that into a star, we can't leave the hat, we've got to change that into a star if that's supported, or figure out what the operator is for stemming. Again, most of those email searching or e-discovery don't search it. But this failed near two, I can't just change it to and, because most of those tools don't support uh, dual operators or parentheses. So I actually have to take this and take failed and deals, add on to another line and say failed and projects. And then I've got, again, I'm going to get more hits than I expected to get. And now I can go and reduce those down by putting my near back in later. And so just like Ian said earlier, you know, here's the actual answer at the end, you know, so we took our original terms here and we, um, we put them back in there. And they turn from, I'm going to put it back up here so you can see it. So here's on the right is what we wanted. On the left is what we actually run in Office 365 or in Gmail or in Vault, whatever you might be doing. So this is just one example of how we go from one set into another set. And then we're going to go back and rerun those file terms so we actually get what we were really looking for. You know, we're, we're, we're moving beyond the limitations of that system. The other comment that we want to talk about here in the limitations of search 
is is really you can use multiple tools. And sometimes we're using two to three tool or two to three passes on the search before we're going into the e-discovery platform. And that's mostly because of something Ian just identified that sometimes when you run a search, you still get 800,000 results and you got to figure out why. And that really tees up kind of our next topic, which we're going to go into after we do a poll is what is the actual um what is the actual results that we're looking for and how do we actually look at things like search term results or other things like that and determine are we going to actually be able to um, see what our results are and get it out so we're, first thing we're going to do right now is we're going to go into our first poll question um, and i'm going to go ahead and launch this poll it'll pop up on your screen and you can give an answer you know how how do you want to conduct most of your searches are you using just keywords are you using keywords and advanced syntax? Are you using keyword advanced syntax analytics? Or are you going, you know, right into my my vendor is going to handle that, you know, that right there for us? So that's, you know, the, our pick our our big poll here for the day. And one of the reasons we talk about these kinds of things is how are you dealing with the search that you're actually trying to put out there? And it looks like we got a, a significant portion of you guys answered out there. So we'll go ahead and kind of move on to our next topic while we're uh, while we're coming through here. And the next topic is search term report. So, and Ian, I'm sorry, did you have any other follow up in our our previous discussion? I moved right on to our next topic there. No, no, no. I, I think search term reports um, and the ability to uh, to know very quickly what you've got in front of you is really key. So, I'll you know certainly back to you. Yeah, we should definitely do these webinars like the Twitch streaming stuff, where our heads are in the bottom left and we can like react and things like that, and you could see us. It'd be crazy. But search term reports are something that are heavily underutilized in the industry. Uh, I think a lot of that is because uh, most people just don't understand the power or their use their usefulness. And I'm going to show the search term report that we ran last time and kind of talk about how we figure out that someone's search was too broad, not necessarily an error, we use the same information to kind of show that something's too broad, and how we actually go about solving this. And I'm going to kind of get into a war story, unfortunately. But um, search term reports, I, I won't show you exactly how we do them, because we showed that in the last webinar. But I'm going to show the results of two different search term reports. And that's actually the same searches we were just looking at. You'll recognize failed near to, near to deals or projects. And if we go through here, we can see that this special purpose, when we originally ran the search, this is what we demoed last time, had 16,000 results. But when we ran it, what I would call correctly, with quotes around it, we got 178 results. And so these search term reports, when I put them kind of side by side, you can start to see that, oh, um, you're right, there are some hits in here that that are that are odd, and are they an error or are they, you know, overly broad? Not, I'm not talking about burdensome. That's another argument for later on. But are these are these too broad a terms? And as we look, and we're going to focus on the one on the left here, which is the which is the correctly run one. We could simply sort this search term report by family, by a dot by unique document hit count, largest to smallest, and we'll see in here that these documents that have this unique account and we're covering this kind of a little bit in more detail now because there were some good questions about it but the indication that this document has the or the the, the word bankruptcy appears in 4423 documents and are set as i scroll up in this report we searched 264,748 documents our review burden which is how many documents we have to review is 11,000 or so documents. So in this case, our unique hits for bankruptcy is what? That's almost 40% of the set that's unique. And then our our hits for, I can't even, what's Dynagy? The, you know, our hits for there is the other 40%. So those are two terms that are that are hitting on documents that have none of these other search terms in them. And so they may be an indication the, um, through our search term report that our search is too broad for that. And so how do we use this in an argument? I'm going to go back to the slide here. When we're arguing either way, you know, you're, you're, and I'm quoting you, Ian, you know, you're, when you're running search, you're trying to look for good answers, or you're trying to broaden it or build it up or tear it down. And so when you're looking at these search term reports, they're a powerful argument for an opposing party, if you're willing to share that information, and you can clean it up a lot to say, look, your searches are overly broad, because it's coming back at 80% of my set. I mean, that is a very strong argument that's made. 
The other thing we can do with search term reports, and, and Ian's going to talk about this in a second in a later demo. So, you know, we don't do it now, we'll do it later, is we can actually take those results and fold the results. And so we can go and say, find all of the, show me all the documents that had the word bankruptcy in them. Show me all the documents that had this word in them. And we could go and review that later with all of our search hiding and everything. And on top of that, we can do random samples of those documents. I've got all, I've got those 42, 44,000, 4,400 documents that have the word bankruptcy in them. Give me a statistical sample of those. I'll review those and then I'll report on that. So these are all the techniques that we use out of space, out of search term reports to help narrow or expand and argue that the opposing party's search terms are too broad or in some cases are too narrow. It's more rare that you have that argument. You know, any, any other comments on search terms that I want to make sure we get on to the rest of our presentation here? No, I, I think it's a valid point, though. You know, not only can you find it, one of the things you have have the ability to do certainly in the iConnect platform and potentially others as well is with the check of a box go and write the results to a folder so that all of your documents that contain that Dynagen search are now sitting literally in a Dynagen folder which you can then share with other members of your team so they don't have to go and run the search they can just literally click the click the folder and get to that subset so that way you've got uh, multiple people contributing to the the workflow of the case where the uh, the results that that one person did can then be shared with another person very, very easily. Great. So our next topic, if you have any questions, feel free to you know fill those questions out there. I'm, I'm monitoring the Q&A and I'm monitoring the chat as well. Um, but our next kind of topic is, is PII. And Ian, I'm going to let you have this one here. You can kind of lead me through and I'll jump in when I feel. Yeah, that'd be great. If I can just grab the screen from you, Gavin, I think you have to release it and then I'll Yes, here it. you go. Stop share. Okay. And share screen, screen one, and go. Okay. Um, and Gavin, you can see my screen okay? You live with look great. Perfect. Okay. So I, I want to talk a little bit about PII, personally identifiable information. Um, and, and what you see here is a very simple list of the kind of things that you might be looking for. Personal information, addresses, phone numbers, URLs, usernames, passwords, and then you get into bank and finance information, credit cards, bank names, bank identifiers. Then you get into a whole bunch of uh, geographically um, specific information in the case of the USA, SSNs, EINs, tax per ID numbers, and then all the other things you might want to search. Now, there's a number of a number of tools out there, e-discovery tools, that don't really give you any way to search for something like a phone number other than three digit dash, three digit dash, four digit. If you find anything with that number, call it a phone number. And the challenge with that is you get just what we talked about earlier, you get exactly that false positives. You get all kinds of numbers that meet that syntax, but aren't really a phone number. And what we've done actually here, um, we're just going to jump into uh, to an actual demo. And um, uh, I'm just logging in here. I'm in Chrome today. I just easily could be in, in Firefox or what have you. I'm going to go into um, a, a data set here that has a ton of PII on it. And this is the kind of thing, if any of you were involved in any kind of um, a governance issue, any kind of CCPA, uh, GDPR, uh, DSAR request, there's a number of different things that you might need um, it, it, it need to find in order to be compliant with the disclosure of information or the sharing of information. So for those of you who don't know, um, uh, P uh, John Podesta was Hillary Clinton's um, uh, campaign manager in the 2016 election. So this is actually a set of about 60,000 um, uh, emails and correspondence. We've called it down to about, about 5,000 or so that contain pretty cool stuff. We talked about running that search term report. So imagine if you will, Instead of running a search term report looking for the word Dynagen, we ran a search term report and said, hey, go find social security numbers, go find EINs. And if you find any EIN, I don't know what ones you're going to find. I don't know what the numbers are. But if you find something that looks like an EIN, sort of has information in and around it, which might make you go, oh, yeah, that's probably an EIN, then put it in the EIN folder. And when I go and click the EIN folder, which I'm, which somebody else ran, actually, I'm, I'm just using the results of their search. Um, so here we are. There are two documents in my EIN folder. And when I go over here and actually look at, uh, just look at document number one here, what you start to see is that this document is, in fact, a tax return. So it makes sense that there's an EIN number in it. Further to that, it knows exactly where the EIN numbers are right here. 
And it's actually gone through the process of extracting out the EIN numbers and automatically creating metadata. Further to that, you can see down here, if there were other pieces of PII of, of, of the, this different list we're looking for that were in here, there would be other check marks on here as well. So um, the, the tool itself gives you the ability to go in and look for information. So again, um, you could be looking for addresses or phone numbers, but you could be looking for credit card numbers, for example, where again, you can go in and write in the metadata itself in one of these fields, sure enough, there's the credit card numbers. And um, we've actually gone through and identified some of these records to be able to say, yep, there's a credit card number. And we have actually gone and extracted the credit card number right there. So it can be a very, very powerful way to go through any data collection, hundreds of records, millions of records, <clears throat> and either have a look at them on inbound or have a look at them on outbound. Because if you can find the PII, you can do a couple of different things. First of all, you can put them all in a folder. Second of all, you can extract the, the PII itself. Or further to that, what you could do is you could, in fact, go in, and you, I don't have it set up here, but you could, in fact, go in and you could say, go and redact that right there. Just go and take that and redact it for me. So that what you end up with is that that information right there gets redacted, a little black box on it, maybe the word confidential, maybe the word credit card, such that when you're disclosing this document to a third party, you are redacting the PII from that record. So ultimately, it gives you a great way to be able to go in and find PII, folder PII. Uh, to, to Gavin's point earlier, you could go and do a search term report using all of the PII searches. And what it'll actually give you is, hey, this is the number of records that contain phone numbers. And this is the number of records that contain EIN numbers. Further to that, we've done this in an English database. We could, in fact, just be, do we could be doing this in any number of languages. What we have actually in the iConnect platform is the ability to do this across 51 different countries. So here's the generic information that we can find. But um, Mike Federowski, who does a number of our demos, always jokes around and says, but in fact, if you're actually looking for Romanian driver's license numbers, we actually have a way to go in and find Romanian driver's license numbers. So this can be an extremely powerful tool. Again, and we see people use it for inbound data, but also for outbound data. We've also seen this used in an M&A transaction where company A acquired all of the, the, all, all of the data for company B, but they wanted to know what, type, what, what kind of information, what kind of sensitive information might be within the data that they were acquiring and amalgamating with their current data set. So again, lots and lots of different ways to, uh, to manipulate the data, but, but certainly use um, the tools um, uh, of being able to find and search and, and organize the PII uh, to take advantage of that in the, within a workflow. Yeah, it's actually been an indispensable tool for us. It's let us get into a whole other set of businesses. We used to use a different technology um, that kind of has died to do this type of searching, and it was very limited, um, but it lets us do a lot more um, breach response, not incident response in the classic sense of stopping the bleeding, but later on, we can go and say, okay, here's all the data that they got access to. Here's the email accounts that they got access to. Let's go in there and make sure there's not PII in there, because if there's no PII or certain things in there, we don't even have to do the exfiltration examination. We could just say, they got into this email account, they read a bunch of stuff, but there was no need to go and do any notification of a breach because there was no PII. But I will and, warn and, you, every time we've I, ever done that search, 100% of the time we find PII. That's a great point, Gavin. In fact, there's a, a default folder that, that we build uh, for a lot of the clients, which is no PII in these records. As in, that's the inverse of here's the one that contains something. Well, here's the one that contain nothing. And sometimes that can dramatically reduce the review burden so that you can immediately identify documents that maybe don't have to have human review eyes on them because they, in fact, uh, you know, the system has said, hey, these don't really contain anything important. So I think we're going to continue on, uh, Gavin, uh, talking a little bit about visualization, correct? Go right on that demo. We'll go right back to the slides after that. Okay, sure. I, I, I'm going to go into visualization and um, and talk a little bit about uh, ways to go and take, take the data and do something with it beyond just metadata. I think that everyone on the on the uh, on the call today is probably familiar with the, the concept of metadata. You know, you, when you've got a record, you've got the body text of the record, but then you've got information of the date, the time, the um, 
the uh, who created the record, the last edited date, the size of the record, the file type, all of that metadata associated with each record in a, in a database. Uh, what I'm going to show you here is that here's um, a bunch of metadata. This is, in fact, incidents. So think of this as, um, uh, I mean, this could be, for example, submissions in a class action uh, where people maybe filled out a survey. And then uh, this is the information, the results of the survey you got in a class action. But this is pretty hard stuff to digest. You know, you've got URC codes and municipal descriptions and retention periods. But this easily could be, uh, you know, the number of times you bought a product, the um, the, uh, the 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 uh, the code that you use to buy it, the discount code, the the size of the bottle, the state you bought the product in, as people are filling out potentially for for a product uh, product liability case. But imagine, if you will, if you could take all of this information here and uh, give yourself a way to actually graphically display this information. So here's a whole bunch of incident information. It's actually a bunch of criminal activity that took place in various different jurisdictions, along with all of the metadata associated with that. So this is a little hard to digest. I don't care what you do. It's a little hard to search. However, imagine if you will, you were able to chart and graph all of this information and create a dashboard. Because the same information you were just looking at a few minutes ago, we've actually now gone and taken and created a dashboard for it. So here we are, we've got a, a, a district called York. And at that point in time, I'll just uh, open that up a little bit. And you can see across here, we've got uh, assault and uh, uh, DUIs and fraudulent checks. And this is actually an incident count in a jurisdiction by um, by by uh, incident type. So here we go. There's there's one for York. There's one for for uh, ETOB. Again, same information. And now I want to go and compare incidents in one jurisdiction to incidents in another jurisdiction. So now I'm going to go here, and now I've got ETOB versus York. And I can easily start to see that and this is it's a little graphic when you think about it. There seems to be a lot more kidnappings happening in York than there are in ETOB. But that, you know, that goes all the way back to, um, you know, anything from car thefts to, as I said, in a class action, maybe submissions of information where it seems like a lot of the submissions are coming from a specific jurisdiction. Let's drill into that data. The other thing you can start to do is that you can start to look at um, incident totals, because not only do you have the metadata, you can tally the metadata and then display the tally results. So you can see here, here's a series of different municipalities. And in fact, you can see, um, uh, you know, Georgina here had 68 of the incidents happen in that area. But graphically, you can very, very quickly see where the trouble spots are and where the submissions are coming from. I'm just going to look at a couple of other ones here. So I think it's kind of neat to see there's a, really nothing more than a, than, a, than a column chart. There's a pie chart. But now you can get even more granular and start to look into this. So now you're looking at a number of different things. You're looking at the total number of incidents, but you're also looking at the type of incidents by jurisdiction. So now think of it from a searching perspective. Gavin, a few minutes ago, was showing how you could sort of do a search on top of a search on top of a search. Well, that's that's all well and good. You don't really know what results you're going to get. But this way, you can very, very quickly see that the biggest problem across all of these uh, all of all of these jurisdictions is in fact DUIs. The second biggest problem there is is fraud credit. And then if you want to go one step further and you want to go, who's this black one right here? Well, that's um, Willembury. I'm going to click on that, and I can actually now go here and I can actually use that as a search filter. So this is now going to take me to only the records that met the search criteria. How did I do the search? I did the search by doing nothing more than going in. And actually, um, and actually clicking on a bar within the chart. So it can be a great way to be able to use searching in a very dynamic way to be able to build charts and graphs, ones that are very, very easily digestible by your team, but also the ability to, to come in and have, um, uh, have that information available at your fingertips. The other nice thing is when a tile is created on a dashboard, and that's kind of the term that we use, I could in fact say, oh, this is good, rich, information. I want to share that with members of my team. And I do nothing more than click here 
and share it with all of these different members of my team. And further to that, I can give them modified delete, share, or required functionality. We see sometimes that uh, project managers will in fact create a dashboard like this for searching so they can drill into the data. They never even look at a document, but they wanna know at an overarching level, how is it going? And this is a great way to be able to come in and, um, and, and be able to graphically understand exactly what you're dealing with. Gavin, back to you. Great. Yes, and I'm gonna I'm gonna parry off parry off of that a little bit by saying yes. The the demos that Ian just gave are kind of a lot of the examples of when we're trying to figure out what we're looking for, and it kind of displays that to you. And some of the other examples you talk about on the slides, uh, and we won't go into this heavy demo, is looking for missing email. You can see using that chart if you had a timeline, which is another option, you could go through and say, oh, I see a bunch of email from this person, and then there's like a three month gap. And then there's more email again. Well, was that because school was out over the summer or is that because someone stopped working or is it because someone deleted a bunch of email or destroyed something or didn't produce it? And so when we look at the screen here, missing email is a very common thing. Custodian and duplication information is very helpful in there, depending on how your data is being processed. If I load Ian's email and then I load Gavin's email, and I've deduped them. Obviously, any email that Gavin sent to Ian or received from Ian would already be loaded. Well, how do I find that? And one of the one of the quickest ways to find that is looking at custodians and looking at pie charts. Uh, we also look at you know different metrics that are out there. So the example that I'm going to show you real quick is um, looking for privileged email. And so I've I've already run the run the pie chart up, and this is the email domains for an Enron set, just I apologize for using Enron again, but there you go. So that's the email domains. And it's really easy to go in and say, okay, I don't want the domains. I wanna see the email addresses. And what I've done is I've sorted this here by the, the quantity of what's coming out there. But one of the options I have is to download an Excel file of um, those results. And so in here, you can see I've got Hotmail has, you know, that's something pretty ancient right there, AOL, Hotmail, Yahoo, et cetera. But what I can do in here is I can go through and quickly search for the word law. And I find, oh, look, there's KS law. You know, what is KS law? If I went to the .com, is it a law firm or is it something else? You know, are there other laws in here? Well, there's VEL law. And, you know, there might be other ways to look very quickly and say, oh, well, that is obviously presumptively privileged. So I need to actually go through and affirmably code that. Similarly, when I'm looking at the domain search in here and I've switched over the email addresses, I can go through and show me the values of who is sending most of the email in the set. And because this is the Enron set, it's very you know rich in everybody. We can see that Jeff, Sarah, these different people have a lot of that area and I can simply click on them and move on. And so uh, we're kind of running a little short on time. So I want to make sure we get to our last um, few topics out here. And as we kind of transition over there, um, we have our, our final poll here today, which is... Um, you know, who, who actually is doing the searching for you? And are you doing it yourself? Are you having someone else do it for you? And, and this is not necessarily to say, are you confident in doing your own searches? This is, um, it is a skill. I search and use e-discovery platforms every day. I'm very used to that. But doing easy searches is easy, but not knowing that your search is wrong is what's difficult. So when we run searches, I build a term list just like we did earlier. I then send it off to a peer who says, oh, you made a mistake. They fix it and send it in. And then I go on. And so, yes, uh, as I predicted here, uh, there's not a lot of people that said that the lead attorney in the case is allowed uh, or not allowed. That's, that's a scary word, is the one doing the searching out there. So our last topics today um, really cover um, example documents and kind of our last method of searching. And so, Ian, I'm going to kind of let you uh, go off here again and kind of show what's going on. And we've got about seven, eight minutes left. So that's perfect amount of time to kind of cover that demo out. So I'm going to stop sharing. And I'll let you uh, talk about example. And the idea of the searching here is that we don't know what we're looking for. So go ahead, Ian. Yeah, no, I think that's great, Gavin. Uh, you know, while I've got this database open, I just wanted to show one other thing. Um, in and around other uses of that dashboard, kind of combined with PII. You know, there was a lot of syntax when I was looking for that Romanian driver's license number. That can be filtered down such that the only thing you need to create for your users is a tile and a button. So if they want to search for phone numbers, all they need to do is click the phone button or the credit card button. You can rack and stack a series of these tiles. So you could, in fact, 
go and create these as a default, load them into a template, and then as you launch each project, um, give your users a super easy way to be able to go in and take advantage of PII searching with something as simple as a single click. So that would just sort of take us a little off topic. You, your question, Gavin, was in and around being able to use exemplar. So I, I think um, I think it's an important question because you know when I go in and I go and say, well, I'm on a, I'm on a document here and um, I'm in thumbnail mode. I'll go to this document right here and I go, you know what? That document to me. I wonder if there are any other documents that are kind of like this document. So we've got a little tab over here called related. And all I do is click related and I go to uh, similar concepts and the system itself will come in and it'll actually give me back with a relevance ranking based on a similarity score, a whole bunch of other documents I'm probably going to want to look at. This goes back to that Spotify example that I said earlier. I'm on a record. I just want to find more like this. However, what if I don't have a record like this? What if I don't have that perfect record? I can create one. And that's called exemplar. It gives me the ability to go and create a synthetic, perfect document and then do exactly what I did there, go find similar. And Gavin, you're going to have an example of that in just a second. Here's exem exemplar right here. It's nothing more than a way, I've got a surgery prep here that I'll show you. And it's nothing more than go to an attorney, go to your client and say, look, what happened? Um, is there a document out there? Do you remember what it's, maybe you don't have a copy of it, but do you kind of remember what it said? What was the gist of it? Or here's a bunch of documents what exactly should we be looking for in these documents? What, what event or, or what topic is really important? So whether it's an attorney or the client, or you go and cut and paste some text out of a document, um, you can in fact go and create a synthetic document. And you can see here, we've actually cut and pasted in a couple of different things. The, the top section here is an interesting one. One of our staff actually went in for knee surgery and we, we asked him, um, hey, you go and give us a paragraph of what happened during knee surgery. Watch what happens when I go and say, uh, find more like this. So when I go into this collection and I'm looking for documents talking about preparation before knee surgery, look what I go and find. I go and find this document right here. And um, you know, these are, are words that are all, all marked automatically through word marking. But look what happens on page two. Um, what happens the day of surgery? And it talks all about exactly the same information that was being talked about over there in a paragraph that somebody made up. And I think that's an extremely powerful tool. And I'm going to stop share there, Gavin, because you've had a situation where that's actually been used um, in, in a real world case to save literally probably billions of dollars. Yes, he's, he's referring to um, many, many moons ago, we did the uh, BP oil spill case. And uh, I don't really have a good slide here, so I'll just, well, why don't we pop our cameras back on? Um, in the BP oil spill case, we had millions and millions and millions of documents. Um, the, the final count was one of our largest databases had 75 million documents. Now, by, doc, by the way, documents, I mean, it is a base stamped document that was produced to us by some party, 75 million. Uh, that one database had 11.7 billion pages. And of course, we just threw it into iConnect and it just worked, as you would expect, Ian. I mean, when that's a whole other webinar to talk about that. But when you ran a search on a database that had 75 million records, there's no way that you would get less than a quarter million records every time you ran a search. It just didn't work. And that, so what we did in that case was we went to our... Um, our clients, and in that case, that was the uh, the steering committee, and said, hey, what 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 are you looking for? And they said, well, we're looking for evidence where Halliburton did this. I'm like, great, write me a paragraph. And they went and said, Halliburton did this, Anadarko did this, you know, BP did this. And it, they didn't write a novel, but we just threw those searches right at it, and bam, it attracted like material. And one of my favorite parts in uh, the oil spill case is um, we, had a, we had two or three floors of document reviewers, which were junior attorney, attorneys or paralegals, and every time they would find a hot document, you got a steak dinner. I mean, that was that was the the reward. You got a salary, you were there, but every time you found a hot document, you got a free steak dinner. And there was this marking up on the board, you know, Tommy's got whatever and John's got whatever. And then all of a sudden down there, there's a Vansic and we went all the way down the board and back four times because of the technology. We were cheating. We were using this technology to go find it because once they found a document, they go, this is awesome. And they say, wait, 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 let me click on more like this from this. 
And then you think, oh, that was garbage. This is so much better. And it was just over and over and over again. And you've got a, you've got something on the screen. Tell us what this is. And we're going to share this in our follow-up emails to everybody here. But tell me what this is, Ian. Yeah, it's actually a, it's actually a case study that was done um, by by IDC, the large consulting firm, where they talked to uh, a number of different parties who were involved in that case, specifically in and around how the use of technology saved time and money. Um, it, it's really kind of a problem solution piece. But for any of you out there who scratch your head uh, in some days and go, yeah, but is there a real world use case that I can cite where this kind of technology really saved time, energy, and money? Um, th this is a great document for you to be able to use um, to with your counterparts or your your client to go and say yeah this technology is real and it really can make a difference and to Gavin's point um, we're going to be making this available I believe via email uh, to the attendees today. Well thank you guys we are at our time we want to respect your time um, Ian and I are going to take a break for a little bit we're going to come back probably in September with some webinars on how you can do all this stuff yourself everything we've shown you but uh, we I, I thank you Ian very much for attending the webinar today and helping us out your insight and your demos are great you know I, I think if we did a webinar and showed everybody everything it would last weeks uh, so we'll get these bits and bits and choices but enjoy the rest of your day everybody Ian any final thoughts no, I, I appreciate everybody coming. And, and I think, um, you know, it was interesting, Gavin, when we talked about how to display search, we wanted to do a baseline education on all the things you can do, but then show a real world application on the difference that it can make. So hopefully the audience um, it sees it like that. And, and again, uh, we are going to be able uh, to make this, if, if I'm not mistaken, um, available in sort of an encore presentation as well um, on websites so people can share this um, with uh, with colleagues and, uh, and, and, and be able to, uh, to to share this with people who perhaps couldn't attend today. Thank you guys. Everybody enjoy your day. Ian, thank you very much. We'll see you real soon. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. We Connect, brought to you by iConnect, making information accessible.